everyone, welcome to Church of the King. My name is Angel. And I'm Christian, and we are so excited and honored to be your host here at Church Online this weekend. And here's the thing, we want you to know that you belong here. You belong part of this family, and it doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done or what's been done to you, you belong in this community. And we believe that today God is going to speak to you during this message. And hey, did you know that we want you to talk in church? Yes, you heard me right. We want you to talk in church. I know it sounds crazy, but if you're joining us live right now, there's a chat room going on that looks something like this. And we would love it if you would engage with us in that chat room. And if you're joining us on a platform where there is no chat room, we want to ask you if you would jump over to Facebook or online.churchofthekeng.com and get on there and engage in the chat room. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to know how long you've been coming to Church of the King. Maybe if it's your first time, who invited you? We would love to hear from you. And as a church family, we get the opportunity to worship God together. So as a global family, let's head into this time of worship and lift up the name above all names, and that is Jesus. So we'll see you here right after. Welcome, welcome, welcome to church. So good to see you all here today. Welcome online family. So glad you're joining us. Let's sing some songs to Jesus, give Him glory today. He is worthy. Lift our voice, clap our hands, lift our hands to Jesus, God is good. Let's sing. We sing. Let praise be a weapon, let silence is the end. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all land.
Come on, don't we serve a good, good God? He's so faithful. Yeah, you know, as we were preparing for this weekend, I was reading in some scriptures, just trying to find the right one to share. And what I found was this recurring theme that really just resonated with me. And it was all throughout the Bible where he says, don't be afraid, I will be with you. Don't be afraid, I will go before you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You're not alone. So, so full of promise. And you know, today I really feel like the Lord just wants to, to remind us that we're not alone. So no matter what we might be walking through right now, might be some hard stuff, some heavy stuff, whatever it is, you are not alone. He's here with you right now, right now. And he will never leave you. So as we sing this next song out together, let's just really focus on his goodness, his faithfulness. We can have confidence in our God. Amen. Come on. Your heart. You're always praying. 
on, church, you have faith. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. Wasn't worship powerful? Dude, God is so good. And hey, if there was a certain song or maybe a line from a song that really spoke to you, we wanna encourage you right now, type it in the chat room. Let us know what God is speaking to you. And if you're just joining us, my name's Christian. And I'm Angel, and it is so great for us to be in church together. And you know, one of the things I love about our church online family is that it is a global community. We literally have people joining us from all over the world. It's so amazing to be a part of something so much bigger than ourselves. And we wanna just let you know, hey, if it's your first time or maybe you've been coming for a while and you've never taken that step to make yourself known, we wanna know you. We wanna know your name. We wanna know your story. So we would love it if you would step out in faith, take a little bit of a risk to get connected and text the word connect to the numbers 822 822. And I believe that as you join into spiritual family, God wants to do something amazing in your life. And if you do that, one of our pastors would absolutely love to follow up with you and hear your story. And I've got to say, Women's Night was incredible the other week. But hey, men, we have something so good for you this coming Tuesday. Why don't you check out this video and we will see you here right after. Hey everyone, I'm Danny, and I wanna take a moment to tell you about Next Steps. Around here, we talk a lot about Next Steps, and that's because it's a big deal. You see, Next Steps is designed with you in mind, so your journey starts at step one, where we wanna help you really learn how to connect with God and the different ways that you can do that here at Church of the King. At step one, Pastor Steve guides you through who we are, what we believe and how we fulfill the mission of reaching people and building lives and how you have a part to play in that. So at step one, we get to meet you and your family and we get to hear your story. Our team can't wait to get to know you at step one. So what's your next step? Well, we want you to join us next week for step one. Don't wait, commit to start the journey today. Reserve your spot now by going to churchoftheking.com slash next steps or just text the word next steps to the number 822 And as always, our team is here for you if you have any questions. We can't wait to get to know you at Next Steps. Men, 
don't miss men's night. Go ahead and mark your calendars now because it's going to be an amazing time of hanging out with old friends, building community through new friends. It's going to be epic. So if you're near one of our physical locations, go ahead right now and be thinking about what you need to do to be there in person, whatever it takes, don't miss it. And go ahead and be thinking, who can I invite? Who can I bring along with me to men's night? But listen, if you're part of our online family and coming in person is not an option for you, that's totally fine because we are gonna have a special online experience just for you. I'll be there with you the whole time. It's going to be incredible. So mark your calendars this Tuesday, March 29th. Don't miss it. And if you haven't been through Next Steps yet, we wanna encourage you to hop in next weekend. We are starting with step one. So, hey, let me ask, what do you have to lose by stepping in and getting planted here at Church of the King? Why don't you come and join us next weekend and see what God has for you? And listen, before we jump into part four of our series, The Lord's Prayer, we know Pastor Steve has a great message prepared for us. But before we do that, we always like to take a minute and say, Thank you to all of you who give faithfully of tithes and offerings. Thank you for being such a generous church family. And listen, maybe you're there and you've never taken that step to trust God in the area of your finances. Well, I just wanna to talk to you for a minute. Listen, we know that it can be a scary thing. It can be kind of intimidating, but I just know for me and my family personally, the first time we took the step to trust God in our finances and believe that he can do more with the 90% than we could ever do with the 100%, he absolutely showed himself faithful. And he's done it time and time again for years. And I believe that God wants to do the same thing in your life. He wants to show you that when you trust him with your finances and with your heart, that he is so faithful and so consistent. So I wanna encourage you wherever you are to consider stepping out and giving through tithes or offerings and trusting God in your finances and see what he'll do in your life. And when you give, we make it super easy for you. You can give in one of three ways at churchoftheking.com and the Church of the King app. By the way, you should download that because it is an amazing resource. It's a one-stop shop for everything you'll need to stay connected here at Church of the King, or you could give by mail. Well, guys, we are so excited to hop in week four of the Lord's Prayer with Pastor Steve. Let's go ahead, get out your notes, engage with the message, and we'll see you here soon. Our Father. Our Father. Our Father. Our Father in heaven. In heaven. Our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Your will be done. Your will be done. On earth. On earth. On earth. As it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. On earth. As it is in heaven. Give us this day. Give us this day. Give us this day our daily bread. Our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive. As we forgive our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us. Do not lead us. Do not lead us into temptation. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us. Deliver us. Deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the kingdom. The kingdom and the power. The power. The power. And the glory. The glory. And the glory forever. 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 Amen. All right, I want to welcome all of our campuses to the fourth week of our series entitled The Lord's Fair. Come on, let's just welcome all those that are joining us. Man, we're excited. Baton Rouge to Biloxi, of course, in Atlanta. Now, all the men and women each week at the Orleans Justice Center, St. Tammany Parish Jail, as well as the Hancock County Jail. I want to make sure to welcome all them, too. Come on. We love all of you guys, all the men and women that watch each week. So we are in a six-part series, The Lord's Prayer, during this Lenten season. Today, I want to talk to you about the number one thing that will hinder your prayer life. I want to talk to you about how unforgiveness can stop your prayers. If you have your Bible, I'm going to ask you to open up to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Speaking of the Lord's Prayer, I trust that you guys have enjoyed this. How many of y'all have enjoyed the last four weeks learning to pray the Lord's Prayer? I do want to say I hope that each one of the campuses, the campus pastors, reminding you guys each week about praying through the Lord's Prayer. We've done a card. You can literally just read through it, pray, pause, and uh, there's great value. I've been praying this way for over 30 years, praying the Lord's Prayer. Speaking of the Lord's Prayer, I did hear something funny this week 
about prayer. A pastor parked his car in a no parking zone in a large city because he was running late. It's a pastor. He put a note under his windshield wiper that read, I have circled the block a hundred times. If I don't park here, I'll miss my appointment. Forgive us our trespasses. When he returned, he found a parking ticket along with this note. I've circled this block for 10 years, and if I don't give you a ticket, I'll lose my job. Lead us not into temptation. Come on. (laughs) That is a parking person that knows their Bible. All right, let's do it again. Matthew chapter 6. I'm reading from the New King James Version. There is power in reciting the Lord's Prayer. There is power anytime we ever recite any portion of Scripture. I do want to suggest to you, though, as I've done the last four weeks, again, we've got two more weeks leading right up to Palm Sunday and then Easter. Again, it's not too early to think about inviting. Who can you invite to church? But I think there's great value in reciting the Lord's Prayer, and yet I don't believe it was simply intended to recite it. I believe it was actually six topics to be prayed. Week one, Our Father. Everyone say, Our Father. Week two, we talked about not only our Father, but, but what, what does it mean to pray? Let thy kingdom come. Let thy will be done. Last week, give us this day our daily bread. Matter of fact, let's do it together. All of our campuses at the count of three, we're going to read in the New King James Version. In this manner, therefore pray. One, two, three. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today I want to talk to you about what I believe that Jesus meant when he said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. The book of Matthew, it's very powerful. The book of Matthew, chapter 5, 6, and 7, those three chapters capture, and there was no chapter and verse. The Bible translators put in Bible, they, they put in chapter and verse. But Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 is what is classically known as the Sermon on the Mount. Right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, it is the Lord's Prayer. Interesting. The Lord's Prayer. Six different topics. And yet, there's one topic in the very Lord's Prayer that Jesus returns to the same topic and he reiterates it to his disciples. And that's forgiveness. I want you to think about the power of forgiveness in a relationship. The power of those of you that are married, right? Somebody said, what's one of the keys to a great marriage? Being a professional repenter. Can I have a big amen right there? A lot of, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I didn't mean that. There's something about a relationship, watch this, that gets, that gets stuck or a relationship that thrives and continues. So much of that is, is, is based upon your willingness to watch this. Ask for forgiveness and give forgiveness. When a relationship gets stuck in a human dimension, so many times if you go back, well, you said this, well, I didn't realize that, and I didn't mean that, but you hurt me when, like, why didn't you tell me? That was like 16 years ago. And you go back, and if you do like an autopsy on a relationship, so many times it's because there was an ought, there was a hurt, There was a debt, whatever word you want to use. There was an offense. There was a transgression that wasn't dealt with. And right there, that relationship stopped. In the same way, forgiveness is not only on a horizontal dimension. But in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaches the vertical dimension as well. There is something about when we when we've not gone to the Lord and asked God to forgive us after we've given our hearts to Christ. 
There's an initial forgiveness. You've rebelled against Christ. You recognize that you need Christ, that you've never received Christ, and you bow your knee to Jesus, and you get saved. But yet, ongoingly, at times when the Holy Spirit points things out in our hearts, if we don't confess that to God, I believe that we can get stuck in our relationship with God. It can hinder our prayer life. It can hinder that sense of God's presence in our life. No, God is not withdrawn from us, but yes, there's mud in the pipe between us and God, if I can say it that way. Interesting, I, I've taught a lot. Matter of fact, I did a series years ago, and it's, it's about time for me to do another faith series where I just teach the principles of faith and speaking the word, and I love the power of faith and teach a lot around it, but I, I've done different series. A number of years ago, I did Got Faith, and, and it's interesting. There's a classic chapter that that most preachers have taught when they talk about faith and speaking to mountains and declaring you know, any obstacles before you. And they use the classic text in Mark chapter 11. Powerful text. Mark chapter 11, verse 22 and 23. It's when Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he says this, Whosoever shall say, everyone say, say that. Say, say. Whosoever shall sayeth unto this mount, be thou removed. Be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but believes whatever you say it shall come to pass, it shall happen. Oftentimes, the preacher stops right there. I can't wait to speak the word. There's obstacles in my life. There's things that have hindered my life, and there's challenges, and I'm going to speak the word. And so we start memorizing promises that... that that address problems in our lives and we attach the promise of God to attack the problem in our life and we start speaking to that mountain. And yet, and yet Mark chapter 11 doesn't stop with verse 23. It actually goes in a little further. Therefore I say all things for which you pray and ask, believe that you receive them and it shall be granted you. Oh man, I'm excited. I'm a faith man, you ladies. I'm a faith woman. I'm a faith person. I'm going to speak to the mountain. I'm going to speak to the challenges. But, but, but it doesn't stop there either. There's actually another verse. It goes to verse, verse 24, 25. And whenever you stand praying, what's that next word? Come on, say it. Boy, that wasn't real strong in church. You're like, Pastor, I like the faith messages. Teach us how to speak to the challenges in our lives. I am. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you get unlocked because the power of God flows through a people of God when they don't have unforgiveness contaminating their tank. And look what he says here. Jesus, by the way, this is a red. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. Everyone say forgive. And if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who also is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, if you do not forgive, if you do not forgive us our debts as we forgive those. Forgive us our debts, vertical, as we forgive those, horizontal. For if we do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive you your transgression. Forgive who? Anything. Forgive who? Anyone. Forgive what? Anything. Forgive who? Any. Pastor Steve, do you, do you believe, is this talking about losing your salvation? I don't believe it's talking about losing your salvation. I believe it's talking about losing your intimacy with God. You show me a Christian that has unforgiveness in their heart, and I'll show you a Christian that's struggling in their walk with God. Oh, this is so critical, my friends. We've got to make sure that our hearts, that, that, that we cannot have any unforgiveness. Let me just tell you, I've often said this to people. If you have unforgiveness in your heart towards another person, it's real hard to stay close to God long term. Forgive us our debts as we forgive what? Say it. Those who have debts against us. Wow. I want to talk to you about the number one thing. I, as a pastor, I'm... Very careful saying those different things because there's often several topics. There's often several items. There's often several variables, several issues. But, but I believe that this is what's called biblical integrity to say the thing, not a thing, but the thing. If you look throughout Scripture, you'll look at the, 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 the cancerous impact in the soul that bitterness has on the people that, that simply will not extend it to others. 
practical way each morning as we come before God, as David said in Psalm 139, search me, O God. One of the things that I do in the morning time when I read the Lord's Prayer and I begin to pray through it is I'll, I'll pray that, Lord, search my heart and know my heart. Try me. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any hurtful way in me. If there's anything in me, God, I don't want anything in my heart, Lord, blocking your power and your presence in my life. Lord, search me, oh God. There was a time in my life, early in my walk with God, where I just felt like I lost the conscious presence of God. I didn't feel like I was lost. I had the assurance of salvation, but I felt like the presence of God, it just wasn't as readily available to me. I, I lost that sense of the touch of God on my life. And, and, and it was a time in prayer when the Holy Spirit put his finger and I, and I realized that there was this person who had hurt me, watch this, and I'd compartmentalize it. I tried to forget about it, but I didn't realize, listen, it was seeping back into my relationship with God. Forgive us, our debts, as we forgive those who have debts against us. The Lord's Prayer is actually found right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Right at the end of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus circles back and reemphasizes forgiveness. This is a big deal to our Lord. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. Look at the importance that Jesus places on forgiveness. The same way that Mark chapter 11 is a chapter on faith. In the same way, what does he come back and revisit? After for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Look at this. Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. This is after the Lord's Prayer. For if you forgive men for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, then your Father will not forgive yours. Wow. Right there. You prayed the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Oh God, I declare your kingdom over my life, over my family, over my relationships, Lord, over my church, my job. Oh God, let your kid, my nation, oh God. Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Yeah. Lord, I thank you that you supernaturally provide and you practically provide. Forgive me my debts as I forgive those. Oh yes, I do that, Lord. Deliver me from evil, oh God. Lord, give me wisdom to, that my steps would not be caught by the snares of the enemy. Oh, yes, Lord. I return to praise for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Oh, I'm ready to tackle the day. What? You got one more thing to tell me. What is that? Oh, you want to reemphasize one more part? Which part is it? How about the kingdom part? That felt powerful. Man, oh, the brand, I can't wait. You're going to prosper me today. Supernatural doors of opportunity. Favor on my job. God, I love, what? That's not it? You're going to do that, but what is it? Oh, oh, forgiveness. Why do you always bring that up? Am I making this up or is this in the Bible? Pastor Steve, how important it is that we walk in forgiveness? Listen to me. Your spiritual life depends upon it. it block, unforgiveness blocks your faith. Unforgiveness, listen, you can lose the conscious presence of God. Unforgiveness. Let me tell you something. I want to say this again. You can't have unforgiveness in your heart this way without at some point affecting it this way. Let me give you three practical ways to live a life of forgiveness. Number one, ask God to forgive you. All sin is a violation of relationship. When we sin against people, we also are sinning against God's ways, God's laws. As we're praying through the Lord's Prayer, we come to this point. It's an important, an important point in, in my prayer time each morning when I'll ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, search my heart. Lord, is any ought in my life towards someone? Ought is like an offense. Is there anything that I have in my heart towards another person? By the way, a brother or sister in Christ or somebody that doesn't know Christ. It's anyone in anything. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. There is a teaching in the body of Christ that says that after you become a Christian, you never have to confess your sin. Well, the problem that I have with that is that John, this was written to Christians. If you confess your sins, pull that scripture up again. If you confess your sin, watch this. If you confess your sins, why does it say sins there? By the way, the unbeliever only confesses one sin. It's the sin of rejecting Christ. And then as believers, we come to Christ, and what do we confess? Whatever the Holy Spirit puts his finger on. That's why it's plural. Singular, the secular person only repents of one thing, rejecting Christ. The Christian, oh, we got to repent for a whole bunch of stuff. Y'all got to repent for more stuff than me. But anyway, here we go. I'm just playing. First, don't ask my wife. She'll tell you the truth. But... 1 John chapter 1, if we confess our sins, what is that? That attitude, that ought, that action. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. The word confess, it's an interesting word. It means to say the same thing. It's to agree with God. Now, I want to just clarify one thing. There is a difference between the conviction of the Holy Spirit and condemnation from the devil. The conviction of the Holy Spirit is like a laser beam. It's very specific. You did this wrong. Own it and confess it. Condemnation from the devil is like one of the, y'all know one of those, those blankets that they have now? My wife has one. They're like 20 pounds. And they're supposed to like weight you down at night. I don't know what, it's like, it's like, okay. And like, I told her, I said, there's nothing attractive about sleeping under a 20 pound blanket. There, there, it's like I, like, I kick things off. I don't want weights on. Come on, can I have an amen? It's just like, woo. Okay, come on. Conviction of the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, watch this. Don't miss what I'm about to say. The Holy, how do you know if the devil's talk, God's talking to you or the devil about your sin? When God talks to you about your sin, it's specific, it's hopeful, and it's redemptive, and it's to the point, and he deals with an attitude or a behavior. When the devil talks about you, listen, God says you made a mistake. The devil says you are a mistake. It's a blanket of shame. You'll never change. You'll always be this way. You're just defective. No, when I look at my Bible, Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. How many are grateful that the Holy Spirit, come on, how many are grateful that Jesus redeems and the Holy Spirit takes shame off of us? Conviction versus condemnation. So, question. Do, do believers confess their sins after they come to Christ? If a believer is a Christian, and the answer is yes. What do you confess? Whatever the Holy Spirit points out in your heart. If you know that you violated a revealed, the revealed word of God, you confess it. And the Holy Spirit will point out what he wants you to, do, to deal with. So, number one, forgiveness begins this way. We receive forgiveness from who? Come on, say it. God. Number two, forgive us our debts. It's vertical. Now here's the horizontal dimension. As we forgive those who have sinned against us, forgive as often as you want to be forgiven. You know, Peter, I love Peter. Some of you guys, sometimes I talk about different people that I admire in the Bible. I like Peter because I, I identify with Peter. Peter is somebody as a kid, you know, I was very hyperactive and still am a little bit. And uh, Peter would just kind of say that. He, here's what you could bank on with Peter. He would say something. It wasn't always the right thing. He would often say the wrong thing at the wrong time. But he was at least courageous and he was bold. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, Peter came to Jesus one day and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him up to seven times. Now, why did he say seven times? Peter was all proud of himself right there. If you understand, there's a rabbinical teaching, rabbis. The Hebrew teachers, they would, they, they would taught, teach in the synagogues. They took from the book of Amos, and they said three times forgiving somebody is a big deal. And, de, and, and Peter went to a whole, he was Jewish. He went, listen, how about seven times? Pretty cool. Yeah, like, in other words, Peter thought, man, I'm, I look, I'm, this is a big deal. Those guys say three times, I'll go seven, Jesus. What do you think about that? Verse 22. Jesus said, I did not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. <laughs> Peter goes, that's another level. <laughs> what was Jesus saying? He's telling Peter to forgive as many times as he's offended. Why? Why would Jesus make such a statement? 
is because that's how many times he forgives. I'm sure you would agree with me that I'm so glad that God is faithful and he's patient with me. I've walked with Christ over 30 years. I thank God that God has not thrown me away. I thank God that God is working on me. I thank God that God is still working and chiseling. And he's, he's loving me. He's convicting me of sin when I need to confess it and own it before him. But, but, but he's been patient with me. The sanctification process for the Christian. Pastor Steve, what is sanctification? It's the setting apart of body, soul, and spirit. When is it done? When you die. And yet the Holy Spirit... God, the Holy Spirit, is patient, working in us, giving us the, both the power to obey God and the, and the desire to want to do that. And yet, it is a process for me, for all of us. It's called the Christian life. Jesus immediately goes on to share a parable with Peter because he says, Peter, you got to get this forgiveness thing down. I've walked with Christ over three decades. I can go back and I can name people in my past that I have no idea where they are with God. And I'm going to tell you something. If you go back, I'm going to put a statistic. 95% of the time, it's because they did not process a hurt appropriately. They got offended. They got disappointed. They got disappointed in a person. They got disappointed in a situation. They got disappointed in God. Primarily, it's in people and they allowed an offense to come in their heart. And watch this. There was a hurt. Everyone say hurt. Everybody say unforgiveness, and everybody say bitterness. There is a progression. A hurt that's not dealt with becomes unforgiveness. Unforgiveness that's not dealt with becomes bitterness, and it defiles many. Peter turns to, Jesus turns to Peter, and he begins to teach them about the importance of forgiveness. Peter, this is so critical. And I want to just say this. If you walk with Jesus, maybe you're a Christian for a month, maybe 10 years, 20 years, you are going to be disappointed with people. People are going to let you down. I'm going to let you down. People are going to let you down. But it's your, listen, it's the grace of God in you that not only goes to God to be forgiven because of your sin, but also extending it to others. Now, I want to qualify. It doesn't mean we don't have boundaries in relationships when people are hurtful towards us. We need healthy boundaries but we still need to release them of the offense. Jesus teaches a parable in Matthew chapter 18, verse 23. It says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts with them, he brought to him and owed him 10,000 talents. He's now teaching Peter a parable of the importance of forgiveness. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he sold that he be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you. And then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. Watch this. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. There's a big difference in price. You'll see it in a moment. And he laid hands on him and he took him by the throat saying, Pay me what you owe me. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet, begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. And he would not, but went and threw him into the prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw that he had done, there was, they were grieved and came and told their master and all that had been done. Then his master, after he called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you of all the debt because you begged me. Should you not have also had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the tormentors until he should pay all that was due him. And so my heavenly Father will also do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Let's unpack this parable just for a moment. Number one, Jesus uses the parable to teach us God has forgiven us a great sin debt. All of us have been forgiven by God if we've come to Christ. It doesn't matter what sin you've committed. It doesn't matter how bad in the eyes of man it was. The Bible says the blood of Christ will forgive you of your sin, cleanse you. There's no levels of sin. It's clean slate. The heart swells with joy because of knowing what God has done in my life. This debt was huge. All of us, we had an impossible debt that we couldn't pay. And Christ forgave us. 
It would have been impossible for you and I to ever repay. A debt that was so huge. The servant owed the king 10,000 talents. The equivalence of $7 billion today in today's currency. The king knew the servant was struggling beneath a debt so enormous he couldn't never repay. So what did the king do? He forgave him his debt. Then Jesus reveals a fellow servant owed that same forgiven servant a debt of 100 denarii. Pastor, how much was that worth? $12,000 in today's currency. He was forgiven $7 billion, and yet, and yet he wouldn't forgive somebody of $12,000. $7 billion, $12,000. We've been forgiven of our sin against a holy God, and yet when somebody says something wrong to us, we hold them in contempt. Jesus relates how the forgiven servant made a deliberate de decision not to forgive his fellow servant. Instead, he had him thrown in prison. When we refuse to forgive another person, we become in bondage to that individual and often hurt that individual as well as ourselves. Jesus then asked one of the most pivotal questions in the New Testament. It's God's question to each of us. Matthew 18, Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I've had pity on you. What does he say? Jesus is saying we are to forgive at the same level that we are forgiven by God. Your debt and my debt of sin against the holy God, we could have never repaid it. And he forgave us. And yet we often hold brothers and sisters, friends, spouses, siblings, relatives in contempt and we hold them in prison. Wow. Interesting, there's a lot of theological discussion on what happens to an individual. What did Jesus mean by that we've been given over to the tormentors? The scripture says that when we do not forgive, it says that we are given over to tormentors. This week I did a lot of study. There's actual two agreed upon understandings and interpretations of what it means when we don't forgive and God gives us over to the tormentor. Number one, some theologians believe that we invite demonic oppression into our lives. Number two, some theologians believe that God allows, based upon our design, painful emotions. Can I tell you, whether it's demonic oppression or painful emotions or a combination of both, I don't want to be turned over to the tormentors. How about you? Matter of fact, I want the blessing of God in my life. Pastor Steve, have you ever had to forgive people? Absolutely. I don't want anything in my life hindering my walk with God. And I know this, when I go back in my life and I evaluate the times where I felt like I've lost that sense of God's presence, invariably when I've not forgiven somebody that's hurt me. Corey Ten Boom, who was the very famous woman of God, she was Dutch and she was in prison. She was in a concentration camp in Nazi Germany and many of you have read her books and The Hiding Place, amazing woman of God. She preached the gospel and she came out of that for many, many years and she was struggling with unforgiveness because a prisoner in a concentration camp had taken advantage of her and she could not forget this and she kept over in her mind, over and over rehearsing this. Finally, she went to, she was out of the concentration camp and this was years later and she went to a wise pastor and, and she said to her pastor, she said, Pastor, I'm, I'm just struggling with this unforgiveness towards this person that hurt me. What do I do with this? Finally, after crying out to God, when she asked this pastor, he said, let me just say this. Have you, have you confessed it to God? Yes, I have. Number two, have you made a decision to forgive that person? Pastor, I've, I, I, I forgave that person, and that, and, 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 but, yet I, but yet I have nightmares at nighttime. And so, so when, I, when, I, when I feel these feelings and I have these nightmares, then, then all of a sudden it's like the enemy rushes in, and, and, and I've, I don't know if I've forgiven him or not. And I have such pain in my soul that I deal with. And as he was explaining this to her, all of a sudden, 
church bells went off. And he says, you see those, you see those church bells? The way that those church bells go off is somebody takes a rope and, and they pull it. And first there's a ding. And then there's a dong. And it's loud. And then there's a lighter ding and then a dong. But, but if that person lets go, if they let go of that rope, at some point, the ding and the dong is going to cease. And he says, if you make a decision by the authority of Christ, if you make a decision with your will, I forgive that person. You still may feel those feelings, a ding. You still may have that nightmare, a dong, but... But if you've let go of the rope, if you no longer hold them in contempt, at some point in time, it's going to get less and less and less to the day that you have victory over that. God will help you overcome the pain of the past if we release those who have hurt us. How many of y'all are grateful for that? <laughs> forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have debts against us. I'll close with this. Number one, we have to Receive forgiveness from God. And I want to say this, my friend. If you're struggling with the sin of your past, ask the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not condemn. The Holy Spirit convicts. It's not a, it's not a blanket to hold you down. It's a laser to get that off of you. You're not a mistake. You made a mistake. Don't ever forget that. As a Christian, you're a new creation in Christ. Number two, we release those who have wronged us. Let me give you then one last point. Pastor, how do I keep my spirit clean before God? How do I maintain a right attitude towards others? We live in a culture that is, it is very opinionated right now. There's a lot of opportunity for offenses, a lot of words that are being said. There's a lot of comments on social media. There's a lot of comments about people. It's almost like people have a license to be offensive towards people. Christians, non-Christians, and and yet, here it is that we stand before Christ and we want to we wanna live in the power of God, right? We, we don't want our spirit to be contaminated. How do I do it? Do, do you, you, you know something that's really interesting? This week, I was, I was studying this out in preparation to help you guys. And the Hebrew word, listen to me, this is interesting. The Hebrew word for, ad, for adversary, for enemy. If you just Google this, the, the word for enemy in the Bible the first thing that'll pop up is the word adversary. Watch this. And then it'll talk about one who opposes. But a third definition, watch this, is one who watches. The word observer. You know what the enemy does in our lives? He watches and he observes waiting, watch this, waiting for us to mess up. I'm going to say this very respectfully. Sometimes people around us are watching and observing, waiting for us to mess up. That's actually called a hater. The Bible is actually the one that talked about haters. How many know we shouldn't have haters in our lives? We should have relationships that build us, not pull us down. So the first step to keeping a right spirit is who are you keeping company with? Are you keeping company with those that are adding, multiplying your life or subtracting and dividing from your life? Are you, are you around those that are building you up, calling you a woman of faith, a man of faith, or are you still hanging out with people that are trying to pull the presence of God out of your heart? I think the greatest way that we can maintain a right attitude is preparation. Then in the morning time, we wake up and go, you know what? I'm going out into a world. I serve a big God, and I know God's hands upon my life, but I know there's going to be an opportunity. There's going to be an opportunity to be offended today. There's going to be an opportunity to be disappointed by a person that's going to become a hurt. If I allow it, it'll become unforgiveness. And if I really allow it, it'll become a deep-seated bitterness. i got to manage that disappointment so I don't end up in bitterness. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. I've told you guys this story many, many times, and for those of you that are new, I, when I was a young Christian, I, I, uh, I realized that I had some bitterness in my heart towards my blood father. He had said some very evil, wicked things. Thank God he got saved on his deathbed. Those of you that were part of our church 22 years ago, uh, my dad got saved. He's in heaven now. Pastor Jacob, my pastor, led him to Christ. How many of y'all believe that God can, listen, save people all the way to the end? Come on, how many of y'all believe that God can do that? 
God literally saved my dad on a deathbed two weeks before he died. And I realized that my spirit, three years into being a Christian, was very hurt. And sitting down with a godly man, he, he led me through. He led me through. Steve, you were disappointed. Your dad said some things. that You allowed that to become hurt and unforgiveness. And, and you're going to have to release him and let him go. And what I did was, and I'm going to teach you guys this principle, and then we're going to close. What I did was, I made a decision every morning for one year. Dad, I, I release you, and I let you go. Now, he wasn't in my presence, but I, I, I said, I release you. Can, can y'all just say that and say, I release you, and I let you go. You know what you're doing? You're releasing them of a debt. The word debt in the Bible is a financial term, but it becomes an emotional term. A debt is when you hold somebody, you owe me. Well, what if they never apologize? Doesn't mean you have to have a relationship with them again, but you have to release them from that emotional debt. I've been, I've been a pastor 22 years, and I've walked with a lot of people through a lot of pain. And I'm telling you, if you will get up every morning and just put it right in there, I release that person and I let them go. But I'm going to go a step further. The pain got out of my heart, not when I just prayed that prayer, but when I actually blessed my dad in prayer. Matthew chapter 6, I'll close with this. Listen to this verse, or chapter 5. But I say, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Everyone, they say, bless. I want everybody to look at me. The devil cannot curse what God has blessed. When you're a Christian, you've been blessed by God, chosen by God, marked by God, called by God. The devil can't curse what God has blessed. And in the morning time, I'd raise, I'd, I'd, be, I'd raise up in the morning, I release you. Dad, I release you. I would feel emotion on the inside. I release you of what you said. I release you of those things. But then I would say, I bless you. God, I bless you. Lord, I bless my dad. I bless, Lord, I pray you'd visit him. Oh, God, with your grace, your mercy. Pastor Steve, do you think there's anything attached to your prayers and blessing him and him getting saved at his deathbed? I didn't save him, but maybe I paved the way for God to be able to do. I don't know. I'm not taking credit. All I'm saying is somehow, some way, God used that for that. I want everybody to say this. Say, I release you. Say, I bless you. You just fill in the blank. Maybe that's a sibling. Maybe it's an ex-husband. Doesn't mean you have to be in a relationship. Doesn't mean that you can't have. Doesn't mean that you can't have. Doesn't mean you can't have boundaries. You just can't hold them in contempt anymore. Maybe it's a business partner that did you wrong. Say, I release you. Say, I bless you. Forgive us our debts, oh God, as we forgive those who have debts against us. Forgive them. We release them. Yeah. This is the number one thing that will hinder your relationship with God. It's unforgiveness. Get it out. Get it out. I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads. I've got one minute. Everybody at all of our campuses, I sense the Holy Spirit right now. God's presence is here. His loving presence if you do not know Christ, if you're not sure about your relationship with God, I want to pray with you right where you're standing, right where you're sitting. All of our campuses, those that are joining us online right now, those that are watching wherever you are around the world, I just want to ask you, do you know Christ? Have you ever received that initial forgiveness from God? The Bible says whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you know Christ? Do you know that you know if you die today that you're ready to stand before God? This is not about joining our church. or It's not about even you and your own strength turning over a new leaf. It's about trusting Christ to save your soul. The Bible says he came and he died. He was buried and he rose again for you. Do you know Christ? Are you at peace with God? The count of three at every one of our campuses, I'm just going to ask for a show of hands. Pastor Steve, pray for me. I need Christ. I need the blood of Christ to wash me and to cleanse me from my sin. If that's you, one two, three. Quickly, hold your hand up high so I can see it. God bless you, ma'am, right there. God bless you in the back. God bless you guys. God bless you, sir, right there. Anybody else? Pastor T, pray for me. I need Christ. God bless you right there up top. 
Church family, let's pray with those that are trusting Christ at all of our campuses. The campus pastors are on stage. I'm going to turn it over to them in just a moment, but I'm going to lead us all in prayer right now. Let's pray this together. Say, dear Jesus, come on, everybody. Dear Jesus, I come to you today, a sinner in need of a Savior. Say, Jesus, I repent of my sin. I let go of my past, and I turn to you. I turn to the cross. Say, Jesus, wash with your blood. Give me a new heart, a new life, a new reason to live. I want you to say this. Say, Jesus, I take my life, and I put it in your hands. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the sealing work of the Holy Spirit and the word of the living God taking root deep in the hearts of your people. In Jesus' name. Hey, thank you so much for being a part of our online service today. And man, what an amazing message from Pastor Steve. As always, he just always brings the word. And maybe you're out there and towards the end of this service, as we're wrapping up, I just want to ask you, are you making a decision to give your life to Jesus today for the first time or, or maybe to recommit your life to Christ? If that's you, man, we're celebrating with you. I just want to say congratulations. I really believe that that is the best decision that you could ever make. And it's not the end. It's the beginning of an amazing life of following Jesus. Man, we're proud of you. We're standing with you. We're cheering you on. And it's the best decision you could ever make. And here's your next step. I want you to text the word decision to the numbers 822-822. Right now, you can pull your phone out and just text that word to 822-822, or you can click the link in the chat room. And really what that allows us to do is to follow up with you. For me, to really call you and, and hear your story and see how we can best resource you and equip you as you're beginning this new life of following Jesus. It's gonna be incredible. And speaking of following up, we have some amazing hosts in the chat room right now. And maybe you're out there and you need prayer for something. Maybe you did just commit your life to Christ and you want to talk to somebody about what it means to, to walk this thing out. Or maybe you're dealing with something. Maybe you're doing well and you just want to celebrate what God's doing in your life. Or maybe you're kind of in one of those valley seasons of your life. And we have an amazing team of hosts that are trained in prayer and that that would love to partner with you and lock arms with you as you're going through whatever it is that you're going through. You know, the Bible says that God is near to the brokenhearted. Maybe you're out there and you're brokenhearted about something. If you're if you're going through some sort of season where where you're hurting, man, we would have we would love to have the honor of praying with you and standing with you. My heart for you as a pastor is that you would not feel alone, but that you would feel like you are surrounded by an amazing church family that's standing with you and praying for you and that you would come out on the other side stronger. You know, the Bible even says that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So whatever it is that you're going through right now, let me just encourage you that I believe God is gonna turn those things around for your good and for his glory. So whatever those things are, maybe bring them to our prayer team right now. If you're watching on the Church Online platform, there's a button that says request prayer. Just click that button and one of our hosts would love to pray for you as you're going through that. And maybe you're, you're on Facebook, you can just type it out. I'd like prayer and our hosts would be honored to pray with you and stand with you. Well, again, thank you so much for being a part of our service today. That concludes our time together. We're so glad that you were here with us. And men, don't forget about Men's Night coming up this Tuesday night, March 29th. I can't wait to see you there. It's going to be an amazing time. You're not going to want to miss it. So we'll see you for Men's Night, and then we'll see you here back at church next weekend. Have an amazing week.